Hi, um, welcome everybody to Typical uh, Bengaluru's uh, May screening of uh, a rifle and a bag. Thanks BIC for making space for creative documentaries in the virtual world. And uh, thank you to the filmmakers today. Arya, Isabella and Christina, thank you very much for sharing your film, this piece of powerful storytelling um, so we will, I mean, uh, they are also known as a no cut film collective. We will come to the story about the collective, which is an interesting story by itself a little later on in the conversation. We will start off with the film, a rifle and a bag, two very disparate objects, which kind of occupy space in your film, which occupy your film. Yeah. You have uh, Somi's quiet resistance as she builds her life, as she rebuilds her life after she has surrendered, um, uh, uh, you know, after being after living a life as a as a naxalite for more than a decade, yeah. And uh, uh, so this is a film for me, which is uh, both profoundly personal and then uh, you know, kind of the politics is so incisive. Um, is this the film you set out to make? Uh. Uh, in a way, I would say yes. Like, of course, uh, in the very beginning, we didn't know exactly how the story would have unfolded and how the process would have exactly been and what conclusion we would have reached. But like, definitely, once we uh, encounter, let's say, the the, to the topic of the surrender Naxalite and we uh, went to see the settlement and met Somi, we were immediately like triggered by the magnitude of the political uh, backdrop of the story. But at the same time, we knew since the very beginning that we wanted to make a personal story. And that's why we were actually looking for a character that could carry this uh, such a complex and uh, uh, elaborate uh, topic. And once we found Somi, we knew that we found uh, the right person to do, to do the film with and the right character that could uh, help the film resonate in a on a more on different level, like both on a political one, of course, because you can't really take it away from the story. It's like, obviously, but at the same time, on a personal level that would make it more universal for also audience outside India, obviously, since we are a multicultural uh, crew. So for us was obviously a crucial, a crucial part. Christina, you are on mute. You may, you might want to unmute yourself. Yes, yeah, I just is that I have some background noise, so I'm sorry for for it if it happens to interfere too much. Um, should I continue the the thought, Avisa? Um, so yes, I think um, the film turned out very close to what we have imagined at the beginning. Um, we, let's say, um, uh, hoped for uh, this, this deep uh, connection uh, with Somi. And from the moment that we met her, uh, we didn't know how it will be possible, uh, considering also the language barrier. Um, and also the language barrier was uh, 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 something to be considered for the filmmaking process as well. But so uh, all this taken into consideration, I think it worked as a, a powerful uh, trigger for also for our um, approach, our uh, stylistic approach and uh, our, let's say, sense of uh, trying to, to grasp as much as possible from these three points of view uh, that we were merging into one. So I think we it's quite close to, to what we have imagined. Arya? Uh, I think Isabella, I have mostly covered uh, what I wanted to say, but we always have believed that uh, this is a collaboration, not just between the three of us, but four of us. So me is a big part of this collaboration. We also say it's co-directed by all four of us, actually. So um, 
in that sense, that was also one of the uh, early, how do you say, motives for us to, I mean, this form of collaboration is something that we wanted to explore also. And we really found a good space to do that with Sumi and Sukram and the kids. So uh, that was, yeah, like uh, Christina was saying, it was pretty close to how we would have envisioned it. And in some ways, really nicer and surprising than what our brain was capable of envisioning at the point of time. Hmm. Nice. So when we, uh, I mean, Christina mentioned language. So uh, coming to the language of the film. Uh, so yes, you know, this, I mean, I keep kind of getting drawn into the word word quiet, you know, to describe the film. So there is the Somi's uh, quiet strength, then there is a brazen kind of honesty, and then there is so much tenderness, you know, so much tenderness that comes from her. In the, the, you know, there are so many occasions in the film when one sees her, she's like stroking her child or like rubbing the child's head. Uh, you know, you kind of, I realize that you don't, you don't, you don't go close, right? You don't go, you, you're not going to the close-ups of your faces. I mean, the frames are always wide. Yet at the same time, as a viewer, one is always drawn to the faces of your characters, drawn to the faces, one is drawn to the eyes because there is always this, uh, this tenderness that's coming out of them. Like, you know, something as quiet and as simple as maybe there is one uh, scene where she is with her two children and in the night and then uh, Sukram returns home. You just see the bike, the light of the bike. And then the light of the bike, the headlight kind of, you know, kind of sweeps her face. So the expression on her face there, or uh, another time is when Sukram himself, you know, when he's gone to see the child in school after, you know, so many months, so you're like staying with him. You haven't, the audience hasn't seen the child, but then that delight on his face, you know, how did you manage, how did you arrive at this language for the film? Um, I mean, is I it something that uh, uh, evolved uh, spontaneously or I mean, were there conversations between the three of you about how it is that you want to approach your characters? Mm -hmm. Well, um, first, of course, um, all of us having worked together before during our, um, our uh, studies in cinema, um, we, each of us uh, were drawn to um, exploring and, um, and employing uh, the sequence shot, but not only as a stylistic choice in the editing, but also as a way to, to capture the flow of reality. Um, and this continuous flow of uh, reality that um, can be uh, captured in this way uninterrupted um, was something that uh, we were working with before. And in this, uh, in this case, uh, because uh, we were in this situation in which we had to, uh, I mean, none of us understood anything. We were in the, positioning, uh, in the position of uh, observers, but at the same time, uh, we didn't want to, um, install any distance with this device. Uh, and so the, the white shot is not always such a distancing device as uh, we might think when the intimacy, it's uh, when the, the intimate uh, space between us and the characters uh, is already formed when we start filming. So um, it, it's something that we wanted because we worked in the, with this uh, device only in our short films uh, and because it was this certain condition and this sort of uh, obstructions that we had, uh, we wanted to explore it uh, further and to, to test its limits and uh, to use it as a form of listening and understanding. Would, yeah, so. but despite that, you know, I mean, but still one is so drawn to the, to the faces. 
So I would That's just like to add one thing to it is that um, it's common notion that we have from cinema that close up means intimacy, which is not necessarily true. I think Christina told me this during our school days, which has remained with me that it really depends on the kind of space that you share uh, with your characters and it really depends the kind of relationship that you have and it's nice of you to point out that you felt that in the film that the physical distance it's nicer if you're truer to it than try to impose a certain already established idea of intimacy so that was one of the things that we consciously wanted to achieve uh, in the film Isabella, have you you have something to add uh, to that? I mean, I mean, obviously, I agree with the girl, and uh, I guess, like, yeah, one element that is uh, beyond, let's say, our control is the fact that both Somi and Sukram are. I mean, their energy is uh, is very intense and is very present, and uh, and I would say that I mean, regardless of our approach, like, actually, because we immediately felt these sorts of uh, powerful presence, we understood right away that an approach like that would have been successful let's put it that way i mean that this energy would have come across even more powerfully with these sorts of long shots in which they would have the space and the time to breathe and move and exist instead of uh, how to say impose a more edited language uh, so yeah i would say that it was both way i mean with uh, some other characters it might have not uh, necessarily come across so powerfully I would say. Mm. So which brings me to the No Cut Film Collective. It's a very interesting word and I love all your emails which begin with No Cut Arya, No Cut Isabella, No Cut. <laughs> I mean, it's like we mean business. <laughs> Tell me more, how did you guys come together? And how has it been? I mean, especially considering that, you know, I mean, you're in, in three different parts of the the world and uh, still continue to work together and i see i mean i was looking at your website where you uh, i mean there are some projects where the three of you are working together and there are some where just the one of you is working and then the director is somebody else so how does it work it's very interesting that you know i like the way i mean it's very interesting how you guys are working together tell us more about the workings of this collective um, I mean, maybe I can start and then the, the girls continue. So as uh, Christina mentioned briefly, like we studied together in a two years master course, Stock Nomads uh, in Europe. That's where we met. Isabella, and because if I can interrupt you one moment. Sure. Uh, this is for the audience. There is a chat box which has the bios of the filmmakers. So please do read through the bios. I did not introduce them in the beginning. And there is also the Q&A box where you can start posting your questions. The format will be where, I mean, we'll take questions from the audience in between and then continue with our conversation. Yeah, sorry, Isabella, you can continue. No problem. So yeah, because we studied together and like, of course, we became not only friends, but like uh, we collaborated on many short films. Uh, once the master was done, was finished, we, the three of us were, were going back to our home country. So I was going back to India, I was coming back to Italy and Christina was going back to Romania. But we knew we wanted to continue to collaborate and we knew that we had somehow to create like a framework for us to to, to keep interacting and to, to keep making films. And so the first thing that we did was that Christina and I went to India to meet Arya and to start the research. And it's in India actually that we decided that like one very important step was to give ourselves a name just to make it more to make it real let's put it that way not, not just three friends chatting about it but like something a bit more official and i would say that since the beginning like we knew that we wanted to create a space that obviously i mean would stem from the collaboration of the three of us but at the same time would also involve other filmmakers and other i mean from all over the world because that's how we have been raised in the documentary film film world and we believe it's like actually something very, very important in, uh, in documentary filmmaking. And that's why, I mean, we, we keep our structure incredibly good. Like we, as you mentioned, like we're also co-producing some films. In some cases, it's just one of us taking care of a project or two or one is directing, one is producing. Like we like to keep this sort of a very agile uh, setup. 
because we believe it's uh, at least for us it's it, it works better and it is something that sometimes it's a bit uh, raises a bit of suspicious industry especially but i mean it's okay like we <laughs> we managed to dive in it somehow and yeah i don't know if the girls maybe they want to continue I think uh, Isa pretty much covered uh, all the points. Like we basically, we are also figuring out the structure of No Cut Collective as we go ahead. So uh, Rifle and a Bag was us three of us doing everything together. But with the new projects, we keep going back to each other. But we also handle it according to our conveniences. So I think that is more important to not have one structure and only follow that, but to have some kind of fluidity when you're like when you are actually trying to work collectively. Because that, because if you have the fluidity, then you are actually looking at the project and not just what your role the collective plays. So we want to be there for the film more than just like have rigid rules as a collective. So that's. Uh, that's what we are attempting to do now after rifle. Interesting. Christina? Uh, yeah, I would add that it was uh, also a way to, to gain courage, let's say, to, uh, um, to start our first feature, which is always like, um, you know, something that uh, comes with a certain pressure, uh, especially uh, concerning the financing or concerning, uh, I don't know, all sorts of uh, aspects of uh, how to, to actually begin things. So I think it was also a, a tool of uh, encouragement, uh, a way of uh, a way of trying to make sense of how this uh, world works. As we were just freshly graduated and we didn't have a chance to work uh, professionally in the world, it was always in the framework of a school, and there are limited things you can learn in a school, as we all know. So um, yeah, keeping together and uh, having um, having this this sort of um, uh, you know again like the point of views of the three of us uh, in order to to make sense of, of of this industry and also to work independently, um, like to not necessarily work with established producers to try to, um, to understand also how each role in filmmaking works, because maybe eventually we will work with producers or with distributors. And in a sense, uh, Rifle and a Bag uh, as a project in itself the, with the filmmaking and the production aspects has been a great school for us in understanding filmmaking. So maybe we will, I see a whole lot of questions already. So shall we just take one of the questions, a couple of questions? Uh, I'll go with this first one, uh, Srinivas Murthy's question. He says, this is a very sensitively made film focusing on the complexities of lives of tribal, tribal communities and working together with them. Thank you for this rich contribution. I have worked as a psychiatrist with tribal communities and I have always been caught between the thought, what is right at the level of interventions in the areas of health and education. One statement in the film, it is our destiny to have life like that. A question for the filmmakers, what are your thoughts about development and processes required for the interactions with the tribal communities and rest of the society? What type of changes and how much of change is right? Professor Murthy from Bangalore. I think uh, you can answer this in the context of how you went about your film because like you said it was an engagement it was Somi who kind of co-directed the film with you guys yeah I, uh, should I yeah please I think it's a very loaded question uh, because I, I, I do believe that certain development was enforced on tribal communities all of a sudden like there was not given enough time for the tribal communities to actually reconnect to the society that was living outside for the selfish gains of the industrialists and so on. 
so yeah it is a question that we actually struggled with while making the film for example uh, when the child goes to the school whether that education is something that is good for the kid whether him getting separated from his mother and the whole reality that he has been used to till his age 7 whether it's okay to uproot somebody like that at the age of 8 and to put him in a school that is not that has not got nothing to do with anything that he has known until now we question this a lot ourselves and we try to address this subtly through the film also do not very directly but yeah i i to sum it up it's a ongoing thought that comes to my mind uh, quite a few times and i think there is no one specific answer according to me it really depends on the situation you are in and the uh, person that you are communicating with so maybe is a christina hmm. you know i was also wondering for christina and isabella what were the references for you because i mean i think at some level arya for arya this was i mean this is something that all of us grow up with right i mean we are aware of the of the of 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 the nexalite uh, situation so what were the references for christina and uh, isabella to kind of uh, understand this i mean were there any references that you brought from where you come from in romania in italy I mean, Italy. I think the any kind of a resistance was uh, many, many years ago. But Romania, you had something more recent. But I don't know if that had any kind of. Uh, I mean, you brought that kind of understanding into into this film, did you? Mm-hmm. I can maybe start. You are and continue. on. Uh, yeah, Christina, you are on yeah. mute. Uh, I I mean I'm talking from a personal point of view I uh, wouldn't probably say if I that I brought like from my let's say my country history or my like uh, cultural history uh, anything specifically in order to as a reference let's say in order to understand the this movement in India uh because i'm aware that like the context is very different the time as you mentioned is very different like i mean we had like a, a partisan resistance but in during the fascism and second world war so it's like uh, the world is like a whole different thing uh and uh, so definitely it was like something that we have been incredibly careful about since the very beginning to find like the right uh, uh, vocabulary let's say to translate many many things that were unknown to us and uh, which was not only i mean the nexalite movement itself but it was like indian society that is incredibly complex and uh, various i would say and it was like really a discovery for us and obviously like uh, we couldn't i mean I- i'm talking now about christina and me and i'm sure she would agree like we could have never ever made a film like this or i would say any other film probably uh but especially like the one we did without in this case aria and also like all the other people who participated from the community in the film that are maybe outside of the film but helped us understanding and really uh be careful with any filmic translation i would say and talking more about the film itself and about uh, uh representing underrepresented community in that sense we had a lot of references which uh we were kind of try to overcome because very often in documentary filmmaking it happens that underrepresented community keep i mean they are represented always as underrepresented community i don't know how if if i'm making myself clear but i always looked from a lens of uh, uh i don't want to say like a patronizing point of view but sometimes it happens and we were we were incredibly careful not to do so like our main goal was that in this case Somi and Sukram and her family were the storytellers of their own story like for us was absolutely crucial and this coming regardless of the background that we are coming from whether we are from India or not it was something that we really really were trying to achieve because we saw it many times happening in uh, in documentary filmmaking and it was really something we were trying to uh go move across let's say from oh. hey, Christina you have anything to add to that 
Yeah, well, um, when we uh, first arrived to India, we, we haven't heard of the Naxalite movement. Uh, and once we understood the magnitude of it, uh, its long history and its ongoing uh, resistance, uh, we were uh, we were a bit surprised that we haven't. We were questioning how come we haven't, and we also noticed as we returned back to Europe that um, many haven't. Uh, only maybe um, yeah, people who were uh, very um, knowledgeable of history, but even those very few, and filmmakers that worked. Um, in these issues, they were the only ones knowing. So, um, so we we knew that there was uh, a lot to learn as we uh, started from scratch. And as references, uh, yeah, as you were mentioning the the backdrop of uh, communist Romania. Um, well, of course, I was. Uh, familiar with the ideological uh, fiber of the Naxalite movement. But yeah, as they uh, draw their inspiration from the, the Maoist um, um, ideology, but also the Marxist one. And uh, of course, this was a trigger point for me because it was yet another context in which the Marxist utopia would be tried out. And of course, that uh, the fact that it's still happening in the present context was, uh, well, surprising and uh, very fascinating to learn about. And uh, regarding similar uh, movements, uh, we, I think, Isa as well, uh, was more familiar. We were more familiar with uh, the South American um, uh, similar movements. Uh, and guerrilla groups um, and uh, less with what's happening in Asia. So we were starting very humble from this position, assuming that we don't know much. And we, uh, we researched a lot online and uh, we talked with people from the region. Uh, we also discussed at length with the doctor uh, from the film that features in the film who was um, a very important um, person in this project uh, because he also um, uh, comes from the indigenous community. Through his stories, we also found out uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, political details and um, that I think we, we wouldn't have otherwise. Um, so um, yeah. In a way, yeah, we had some references, but uh, we, we tried not to uh, make too many parallels and start as if from scratch in order to understand it uh, deeply. Um, yeah, and uh, regarding uh, the question that was uh, asked, yeah, as Arya said, we try to, to pose it in, in the film through the lens of education. And uh, also through the, um, I mean, in a way we tried to, uh, to set up through the stories that people were sharing, uh, the characters were sharing uh, among them, also a sort of, um, a sort of a more balanced, uh, balanced look on the movement itself in the sense that it, we should consider that it has brought upon some changes that uh, were beneficial. And uh, while others, uh, we can highly criticize that they were uh, maybe excessive. So in, in this sense, yeah, I think uh, it's worth studying the movement, especially for uh, the, the changes that they try to propose theoretically and then uh, in, in practice what happened. But I think uh, that, yeah, the ideas they, uh, they propose throughout time are, um, are worth studying through, through what happened in, the, in this long history of 50 years. 
you know, in this context, so Sunanda Bhatt has a question. This is for Arya. As the Naxalites who had returned to the community, were they accepted by the others? What's the view of the larger community about Naxalites? Said, it's a big word, I would say. I mean, I, I wouldn't say that like they are completely rejected by the community either, but they're living very isolated from the rest of the community. Mostly they find uh, their settlements closer to the uh, police station for the protection from the Naxalites who can at any given point harm them. While we were there, we barely saw any interactions with the villagers where we were staying and the settlement. So there can be a cordial, probably, interaction, but I don't think uh, they are accepted in its fullest sense. There is still a sense of fear. I would say mm -hmm. that it's attached to being an ex uh, Naxalite. That was my observation, but also where we stayed is a town and uh, settlement so i don't know how it is in a very small village but this is my reading hmm. so uh, going back to the film uh, you know i was uh, watching an interview aria again with the uh, asian film archive which i had really up. yeah and uh, i mean i'm sure all viewers are uh, uh, the most powerful scene in the film is where she she uh, speaks to her son. She shares her story about her, uh, her years as an Axelite soldier with her son. So in that interview, Arya, you say that uh, Somi was very keen that the, that moment is filmed. She wanted that moment to be in the film. Uh, you know, so the, uh, so I think this is, uh, this is, I don't know if I should frame this question in the context of uh, uh, bringing in uh, a, the, a fiction narrative into a non-fiction format, or uh, uh, I'm very interested in, uh, I mean, as much as I'm interested in that, I'm also interested in um, uh, this negotiation. I mean, you also mentioned earlier about uh, Somi co-directing the film. So, you know, and then she knows that, she tells you that she wants this particular uh, story, where, this particular scene where she's like telling her son about it to be filmed. So there is a clear, uh, I mean, she did, some of the narrative is, uh, how much, how much, did she, how, what was the negotiation like between you, the three of you as filmmakers and so me? So, uh, sorry, I, I don't remember exactly what I said. Oh, okay. <laughs> Okay, so what you say, I mean, there are, it's a, I mean, it's a fantastic, there are many things that you said. Um, one of it was that uh, 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 this Somi wanted to uh, share her story about her life as an Axelite soldier with her son. Yeah, and uh, she wanted that to be in the film. So yeah. the was that we always wanted this scene very much, but it was really, really important to us that Somi also wants the scene. So there was a lot of talking and then there could have been a possibility where Somi, if she wanted, could have said, don't film this guys. I just want to tell this to my kid. But that wasn't the scenario. She actually came to us with a proposal that we should be filming this moment because that is the way her kid will also pay uh, fullest attention to what she's saying. So um, I negotiation in the sense there were a lot of conversations i wouldn't call them negotiations necessarily but i think we, we used to talk a lot outside of filming like we have spent i think same amount of time talking as we or probably more amount of time talking as we have also spent filming so and she was extremely sharp to immediately understand the film that we wanted to make so I think I would give more credit to her here that I don't think it was just us uh, proposing it, but she understood uh, what this film was about and she resonated with it herself. So that is uh, how uh, some of the scenes happened. Well, some of the scenes just happened and we were observing them. While uh, sometimes we, like in the government offices, we were also part of uh, initiating the process with her there. But, For example? Uh, as in we used to go with her to all the processes and we used to try to get permission to film. She, were, she was doing all of these processes to get her kid into the school. 
but i think when we came into the picture we started doing with her to uh, do it and we tried to keep a uh, tab of it till the film was over and actually dadu got his caste certificate also which, which made us quite happy oh yes. so yes is it he got oh, the that's fantastic that is a huge development don't take all the credit for it of course it's mainly the officers and somi and sukram struggle but we tried to keep tab as much as and we tried to be as much of help as uh, we so they, they didn't i mean i'm so excited with this revelation actually <laughs> because that's where you leave the film right so they didn't need to go to chatisgarh it came it happened here yeah it happened uh, a few months after we had locked the film actually so it was quite nice that's fantastic so he's back at school i mean because of covid nobody is now <laughs> but uh, yeah he's uh, he should be back when the school is reopened yeah and talking about the school i guess uh, you have some very pure documentary moments that you know that kind of came into your camera at the school right so there's a question from gautam here he says gautam sonti he says the scene in the school where they seem to be indoctrinated to join the armed forces is that something you saw often unlike in europe or oh, where okay unlike in europe or the us there are oh wait the question disappeared yeah unlike in europe or the us there are a large number of aspirants for the armed forces which says a lot about the lack of meaningful jobs here any comments on that i thought this was also going to be about how you managed to get this little child looking so bored and disinterested with the you know with the very catchy i mean the tunes are also catchy and the rest of the kids are like holy in it but then this child is wholly disinterested yeah but uh, the you know the driving of this uh, this narrative about you know about the heroism that's Uh, with, that's associated with joining the armed forces and i mean about joining the mainstream i mean because i think that is what this is about right yeah i mean i can maybe say something and then mm-hmm. yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Uh, for sure like when we went to film the school like we we didn't know very much what to expect obviously like uh, because he was initially admitted with this uh, let's say Uh, opening from one of the officers like uh, we we knew that it would have been like an important part of the film but we didn't know exactly what to expect and um, yeah i mean obviously like the the scene where all the kids are uh, chanting together was like uh, very powerful for us because we were not like they were like doing some other class and math and stuff and then this other professor this other teacher come in and he starts singing and we see the enthusiasm of the other kids which was quite surprising like we were not uh, expecting that and i would say that what you see on dadu's face uh, is more like uh, a sort of um, disorientation because he was like he was in the first weeks that he was there more or less or no not the first week i mean he was already there for a bit but he was still like struggling a lot as then he says to his dad as well with the language even because like he was one of the few uh kids from the tribal community and he was still not uh, speaking uh, hindi or marathi which was the language of the school so he was still very much lost for many many reasons as i mentioned like because he was brought from a completely different context like he was never out of the settlement and all of a sudden he was thrown in this new world very far from his parents uh so we knew that this would have been like for his development like something quite crucial and we wanted to to portray it uh i mean regarding the question like maybe aria is much more entitled than me to talk about indian schools uh coming from a european uh, educational system it 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 does look uh, at least the school where we filmed it does look uh, different like in the morning adunate or in this sorts of chanting so in that sense uh, it is uh, something different from what i'm familiar with uh, i again regarding how often it, it happens in india it might be aria more entitled than me to to answer so uh, i actually am not that entitled either i went to a very arty school when <laughs> these things happened but i am from friends and 
from many people i know that it's pretty common for us to have these scenes it just uh, stood out a lot uh, i mean in school but it just stood out a lot considering the context with which we were looking at dadu at the point of time so oh. i think singing songs singing inspirational songs singing prayers in the morning doing all of these things having the pt is a very common drill that it happens that has been happening for years but it really stood out when we saw dadu reacting to this and how he was reacting that was for us the crux of it oh yeah so gautam also adds that it's a powerful scene but i was surprised that the indoctrination was necessary yeah uh, there's another question after that from nilima indraganti who says uh, firstly the movie was absolutely wonderful so congratulations i would like to know how you prepared before shooting this documentary excluding general research because unlike a lot of other documentaries it did not look like a bunch of interviews put together but an actual feature film with a pre-written story almost in brackets with a certain flow and progression in the protagonist's life how did you manage to get that quality in the documentary well thank you for the observation that's a very uh, very appreciate it <laughs> yeah um yeah i think that uh, when we started off um what we knew in terms of narrative was that uh, we are going to uh, follow the process of uh, somi trying to educate her son and uh, from the beginning we knew the obstacle of the caste certificate uh so this was uh, let's say the starting point in building our narrative what we didn't know of course was uh if uh, during the shooting uh, uh period they would manage to obtain it or not and we were prepared for both uh for the both uh, um options um and then uh, regarding the uh sense of interviewness of the scenes um well yeah because they were not interviews and uh well again we have to uh give full credit to the characters of the film and especially to somi uh because even though we would sometimes um establish before shooting what would be a general direction for the scene or we would know for example in the case of the um, of one of the of the man from the settlement uh, trying to go back to his village but not managing to saying that this was uh, was almost uh, about to die uh, that was a story that uh, he already shared with the characters uh we've uh, heard it afterwards and uh we said okay let's try it out again that was a sort of re reenactment that was the closest we got to reenactment uh otherwise we didn't uh, employ this sort of reenactment and uh we didn't know if this will work or not i had i was quite nervous about it and i thought probably it won't work out like because this story he already told to somi and they would probably show it uh, it would be you know felt that this is not the first time she's hearing the story but that was not the case and it feels like a fresh story being told to them yeah. um so again this was really the uh, the sense of presence that they have uh, throughout the film and so me certainly manages to to pull to pull everyone inside the scene and it's very obvious that she's the driving force um and other times we just uh film spontaneously uh without uh giving any any sort of direction to the scenes so uh it's a mix of these approaches coming together 
And uh, yeah, the film was written in the editing because uh, we also while filming, we had no clue of what was being said, mm -hmm. but we were translating as we were shooting. So because we didn't shoot continuously and then translated everything, we had breaks in between in which we were shooting. And then from the footage we gathered, we would uh, try to find a direction to go. But then the school was always the, the let's say the main narrative that we would, um, the skeleton. And then in between, we would find all sorts of uh, elements uh, in order to multi-layer the, the story and bring more angles to it. Yeah, in that way, you know, the film has a very clear narrative arc, so to say, right? It's, mm -hmm. uh, so, so you, you sh shot it in, I mean, the, so one sees the final edit, was the film shot in the same chronology or? Almost, yeah, I would say, but uh, for example, the uh, end scene, if I was to reveal now, was filmed uh, at the very beginning of the shooting uh, stage, in our first week. First week. Yeah. That's interesting. Tell us more. I mean, Arya, you, I, I interrupted you, actually. You were saying something. I just wanted to say that um, this is the aesthetic choice that we made. We, a, we also got very lucky because Somi got pregnant. And uh, so there was also a lot of help that we got from the situation itself to build a narrative. And uh, secondly, the aesthetic choice we made worked for us. But I do feel that, uh, I mean, it, it is no judgment on, I mean, there are many documentaries with great conversations and great interviews also that work really, really resonate really, really with the audience. So we were not trying to imitate fiction from any angle. This was just the way with which uh, it worked for the three of us to interact with. So. Mm. Yeah, Isabella, you had something to... Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I agree with the, what you said and what mm. just Arya said, that it's something that it worked for us in the interaction with Somi. Again, I would bring the, the language barrier because we, we, did, we, we thought it was important that Somi and all the characters would speak the, the language that they were more comfortable with, the language that they do speak in their daily life. And this already, in a sense, like was, uh, I mean, we believe that these sorts of um, obstacles usually force you to find good solutions to it. And uh, so knowing that during the film, I mean, in the filmic space, we would not be we were not going to be able to interact with them in, uh, in their own language, it made natural that then the interaction in front of the camera would have happened among, uh, among them in, again, in the language that it's their language, which it's very important also for us to come across as a, as a cultural heritage in a way, because mm -hmm. there is these sorts of language also run the risk of kind of extinguish in the, in the modern world. So it was also crucial for us this, which then brought us to these sorts of, uh, among other reasons, to this uh, approach. Mm. So now that you have let us in on the secret about the last scene of the film being shot in the first week, when I knew you filmed this over three years, so at what point did you realize that, okay, now we have a film, we don't need to film anymore? When did you arrive at that point? I mean, did something happen or? After we filmed at school, I mean, I don't know, maybe I'm saying this for myself, like when we filmed at school and that entire section that we had, we had a big uh, thing in place, like when we could film the Admin school and when he was here at one. But maybe, I, I mean, that's just me. No, I would say yeah, that. And also, of course, also the scene in which Somi shares her story with Dadu, because that is actually one of the very last scenes we have filmed in the okay. film. And I would also say that at some point, like, uh, uh, I mean, trying to be also with a little bit, you know, grounded. We are in this sense, we are quite disciplined in, in, in the way of how we approach the film from a production point of view. We told ourselves that at some point we had to finish filming. Like we knew that we had to decide that that was enough because 
with this sort of film, you could film whatever, like, you know, possibly we could have kept filming for 10 years and have a better film, a longer film, five films, like, but then at some point we told ourselves, we, we played the part of the producers that told the directors, that's it. That's what we have. We've been filming for a long time and that's the film. Because we, dis because we did want, I mean, we were not upset about an open ending, actually something that we welcomed quite uh, happily. Uh, but with this open ending film, you could, you know, keep filming forever. And uh, so we kind of a bit decided that we knew we had enough and we would have made the film from that. Then we had the next scene that we filmed while we were editing, but that's not, so it's a small story. Okay. So you were editing in parallel as you were filming, right? So because I think one of you earlier said that you knew what you wanted to kind of film in the next schedule. We okay. needed to so, know the material also because we didn't know what was being said. So it was crucial to translate and see what we have in our editing. Mm. So which we shall take you to the next question from Ramani. He says, uh, congrats. Thank you for this rare film made so compassionately. I felt the film does end with a note of sympathy and helplessness. As a collaborative film, the characters too are making the film along with you, but the film's perspective is tilting towards the filmmaker's perspective or needs. I felt the heaviness of the protagonist's dilemma could have been lessened by revealing the fourth wall in some way. Would you comment on this? Also on the discipline you arrived in cinematography and sound recording, which was amazing. Let me see if there's more to his question. Yeah, that's where he ends. The fourth wall. Who wants to talk about this fourth wall? Um, yeah, uh, I would say that um, we were not very rigid uh, in following the observational uh, style uh, canon, let's say in which the characters uh, would have to be hindered from interacting with the camera or um, uh, yeah, just exclude these moments or even push the characters not to do it or uh, explicitly tell them uh, what, yeah, what we expect from their relationship with the camera. We allowed this relationship to uh, to unfold as uh, each of them felt like. And uh, this is uh, how we, from the beginning, Somi had uh, this attitude towards us with the camera there. She just continued to do her, her things. She continued to have her conversations. Uh, while with Sukram, uh, he was, uh, he felt the need of interacting more with us. Uh, he, uh, he found in the camera in that uh, moment in the school that you were uh, mentioning when he's waiting, he even uh, interacts with the camera saying, talking with, with the camera which are moments that we find beautiful and uh, we we really wanted to preserve to leave them in the film and not to exclude them for the sake of having a purist approach uh, because for some um, yeah the uh, observational uh, style is something uh, mysterious to achieve and thus uh, very um, very uh, fascinating in itself because how do you manage to make the characters uh, uh, not interact with the camera uh, and be so natural well it was uh, mainly how they were uh, feeling towards us us behind the camera as uh, of course they are reacting to us not necessarily to the camera but at the same time we shouldn't be naive and I think they uh, they are they were acknowledging the fact that they will be seen by others, and uh, this was always there, and uh, yeah, it was their way of uh, portraying uh, themselves, and 
of course, the camera triggers a sort of performance from everyone. And uh, I guess what we have from the film is uh, how they wanted to be represented and uh, how they uh, and how they felt around us, us three, that we were there. So are you, uh, did you at any point, uh, since you were editing in between the shoots, in between your shooting schedules, did you at any point share the, show the edits to uh, Somi? Yeah? We did. Can you we tell did. us more? We okay. We showed her the edits. Uh, I mean, she knew as much as we knew about in what direction the film was going, because it was pretty much going as her life was uh, happening. And uh, yeah, uh, just to go back to it, that we were not trying to be fly on the wall at all. I don't think that works. It's just to find a comfortable way of being around. And there are more evident ways of baking the fourth wall, uh, but uh, we didn't find it necessary to do that. We have glimpses of it where I, I do believe that they're very much present of the camera and they're reacting to the camera also, just maybe our voice is not in our voice, but it's in the way we are telling the story. And uh, that, uh, and the heaviness of uh, protagonist uh, dilemma, it's the heaviness that she also feels. And it's the heaviness that her as a revolutionary, she really wanted to convey that. Like the one of the first things that she told us after we finished the film was that this is not just her story, but it's a story of many mothers like her and that should be the message that should go across so yeah we uh, we like it along uh, with somi i would say and it was the same with editing like we showed her the cuts and we showed her the uh, the when the film was also over she was the first person we showed the film to when we had the car she liked it <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this trope of the mother, no, which is a very common kind of uh, theme in any kind of film, I mean, especially in fiction. So how you, I mean, you play with that trope and then, but you kind of also turn it over its head. Isabella, you have to, you have anything to add to this comment about breaking the fourth wall, revealing the uh, I mean, wall. the girl, the girls covered most of it. And yeah, I would say that uh, as much as we were not rigid in it, we also, uh, on the other hand, yeah, we didn't feel the need to necessarily break it. And uh, we, if it would have happened, let's say naturally while filming or in a scene or any time that has happened, we, it, it is, there are just glimpses, but it is in the film. And if it would have been an occurrence that would have add meaning to a certain moment or to the film itself, we would have uh, definitely uh, kept it in the final edit. But it also didn't happen in a, such a obvious way, so we didn't want to force uh, to force it. And yeah, we didn't think. Mm. So this uh, this film did exceptionally well in the fest festival circuit. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't have expected any issues in the in the international uh, circuit. But in India, did you face any kind of issues uh, relating to censorship with? Uh, with screenings of this film, we didn't try to get the censorship certificate. Yeah, so. not with no, no, not with regard to getting a censorship. Not to, not about getting a piece of paper, but in terms of uh, any local festivals or any local sc Indian screenings. I mean, do you think the fact that it was uh, addressing something that is kind of uh, disturbing the uh, the state uh, did that kind of affect any? Did it come in the way of uh, the film having a good run within India? I would say no until now. Like whoever has accepted it has been able to show it, and because a lot of things have happened online this year, online. It's very different. I mean, this is all a very new thing for us. Like we were there at the premiere, and then we have not seen the film in theaters after that. So. All the festival run is actually virtual online. So uh, I think that way also because of 
the digital scope that this film can have online, I think we did not really get to check it with the ground reality of what it could have been. Mm. Uh, so I, we didn't really face any problems. Okay. Okay. So the next question is from Omkar Khandagale. He says, didn't you ever feel as though the camera placement may be hindered how they portrayed themselves? or said certain things. That is, when in the frontal recurring two shots, uh, whereas at a point when the camera seems further away, you saw a certain break in character in the father when talking about family names, which seemed more true to him. I don't know if I understood the question. Did you guys understand the question and you want to answer? Is it the scene with Sumi and Sukham talking about that is yes, yes. I think he's talking about that. He's saying uh, because of how you place the camera, this thing about intimacy that you talked about, I think. So he feels that at a point when the camera seems further away, you saw a certain... So he feels that you were too close and therefore they were uh, self-conscious. I mean, I noticed that uh, Sukram is a little more... Uh, he's a little more shy, unlike her. But I think what he's talking about is uh, something else. Yeah. I remember it, it was in the beginning of our filming where we, we had also not established the relationship that we have with Sukram that slowly evolves, like you see it evolving in the film. I don't remember exactly what was the reason why we placed the camera where it was now, sorry. But um, it was really late at night and it was very dark. So that was, I think, probably one place where we could have placed it. But yeah, I agree with uh, him that Sukram is evidently uncomfortable uh, there. And I don't think it's just uh, because of the camera. He, in general, is a person who just likes to do things. And the less talking is the best thing uh, when it comes to him. So uh, I think a part of nervousness also comes uh, from that. I think like another part of nervousness also comes from the conversation he was having with uh, with Somi. It was about uh, they were discussing the the name. Somi was suggesting Sukram to change the surname of the kid in order for the kid to get Somi's oh, father. Scene. It's the scene afterwards. Oh, sorry, I mistook the scene. It's the scene by the fire that comes later when she's saying change the last name of the. I I think it's that one, no? I don't know. I think it's that one. So like, yeah, yeah, was like she wants, she suggests that her father's yeah, name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they have this sorts of they quarrel in a way a bit. They are quite discreet in general, so it's not like a fight. I wouldn't call it like that, but they have a let's say a small quarrel. And I'm not sure if the question refers then to the fact that the camera moves closer and then. There is like a, a closer shot of Sukram looking at Somi. I, I'm not sure whether it's this. The I, I didn't really understood the, the the reference. Maybe Christina understood better and she can say something. I guess mm -hmm. it's about that. And um, and yeah, I mean in that in that moment, it's, it's intentional that we show we wanted to show Sukram's reaction to the to the conversation because it's one moment in which he is more he kind of participate as much as saw me in a conversation if you can say so and they are having like this discussion which is quite crucial for us in regarding not only the film but also their uh, their relationship mm -hmm. um yeah no i remember very well that uh, while uh, we started filming the scene uh, from far because they were having uh, yeah they were we they were having previously the discussion about changing the name which was yet another sort of solution to this uh, to this um, complicated situation of the caste certificate and um, well we uh, felt that uh, sukram of uh, Mm, yeah, felt like uh, this is too much. Uh, what Somi is proposing is way too much for him. And it was, yeah, the first time for us to see him, uh, to see him uh, assert, yeah, his, uh... assert yeah, his, his position in front of Somi. 
so uh, I felt this energy as I was filming and then I uh, immediately went to, to film him. And for me, when I saw the, the scene afterwards, um, it felt like he was uh, looking at Somi, not really knowing who she is. It felt something, uh, it felt like that look had a long <laughs> wavelength, let's say, was looking somehow deeper and trying to, to understand in a sense that he couldn't recognize her. And at the same time, he was, I think his pride was uh, attacked. Mm -hmm. That's the thing about uh, Somi, right? I mean, she has this very easy kind of a confidence. Yeah, I mean, be it when she is talking with the officers or, you know, it's, 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 it's such an easy confidence. I mean, you know that she's, she's a survivor. Mm. Yeah, so Anirban has a question and he says, as you know, Arya, I love this film. Tell us a bit about your experience of working with consulting editor. Okay, this is for a filmmaker. Uh, should we come to that part of it? Uh, yeah, I think, no, we can address this now. Okay, uh, tell us a bit about your experience of working with consulting editor and how was the process and how did the final structure evolve? Nice, this is a question that I would also like to. So uh, I'm going to pass this on to Isa Christina because I mean, we can talk over this, my point of view over the phone. So I think their experience is what. Maybe I can say something. So uh, yeah. how was to work with the consultant editor? So we we met actually the our editing consultant, uh, Yael Bitton in, uh, in IDFA while we were in Itfa Academy with the film. And we, we have, they, they ask you to, to, to be matched with some expert that they will look at the footage and help you a little bit. I mean, they're very short meetings. And we were like, uh, I mean, we were eager to do so, but because we know it was going to be a short meeting, we were not expecting like anything groundbreaking, let's say. But then Yael is uh, incredible as a, as a professional, as an editor. And so it was groundbreaking, actually. And we we did, we, since that first meeting, we knew that we wanted her. She immediately understood the footage. She had incredible insight. Like, we really were speaking the same language in that sense. And so later on, we asked her to, we couldn't ask her to be the editor of the film because she's incredibly busy. And I mean, we anyway probably couldn't have afforded her on for the budget. But then we asked her to be the consultant and... Um, I mean, she had like a very precise and uh, punctual uh, insights on the on the film. We because any everything was a distance, uh, so we we would send her like already a quite formed, quite not so rough uh, rough cut, and she would comment on this and uh, send us uh, back her her suggestions, and then we would make some other changes and send her back the. Uh, another cut and we had like several Skype uh, conversation uh, it was like yeah, I mean she did help us in already quite an advanced uh, stage of editing because it would have been impossible to do otherwise but her remarks really really helped us to actually shape also that first cut that she that she saw I would say and it was uh, very very crucial I mean I don't know how much to add on it because it's, it's not fascinating as a process. Everything is very Skype and email and... <laughs> yeah, I guess I, I can do for the first thing. Yeah, it was uh, important for us to have some sort of um, reality check on how we were reading some scenes. And um, Yael um, had like an incredible sensitivity and um, and uh, intuition and uh, also in terms of yeah in terms of editing it was um, she really understood what where we are trying to go and she was really uh, focused on helping us achieve what we want 
on uh, not really imposing any sort of uh, of um, ideas, uh, let's say, in a way. And uh, what um, I was impressed with was an email of hers in which she commented on every cut of the rough cut <laughs> with things like it works, it doesn't work, or uh, even more detailed uh, uh, remarks of these talks about a certain thing, uh, this uh, uh, touches on this and that. And uh, this was uh, very, very helpful in order to get a sort of confirmation that what we were doing was being read in a sort of same uh, wavelength again. Yeah. Sushma, I think you're on mute. Okay, sorry. Um, we'll go to the next question. Um, thanks for your effort. This is Apoor Tomar's question. I mean, observation, I think. Anyway, thanks for your effort of making this film. I'm sorry, I still haven't seen the entire film yet. Uh, the half of it that I have seen till now has been very intriguing. I think research is important in a documentary project with a subject like yours. And according to me, there are phases of research and understanding one that probably happens before the point where you decide what to document and probably how, it, how to document. And then later, which comes while shooting the film, along with the whole process of making, editing, and even post-production. I was wondering what research really means to you, meant to you in this case. Does it alter your initial understanding or idea of what you want to make? And how much is the film governed by factors, uh, by factors around your collaboration? And how much does it grow on its own? Can you please share your personal opinions that were additions to the narrative, if any, especially to Christina and Isabella? Uh, cause of looking at the subject and characters from a fresh eye. Yeah, so he's especially interested in the kind of research that went into the film and uh, what Christina and Isabella brought into the film as outsiders. <laughs> um, yeah, the research, well, after, after meeting Somi, uh, we had to leave. It uh, was our last uh, week in India uh, after the three months we have spent there. Uh, so after meeting Somi, uh, we returned home and um, we started uh, researching uh, more thoroughly on the Naxalite movement and the surrender policy and uh, also uh, whatever representations there are of the surrendered, um, the surrendered uh, revolutionaries. Um, for this, we also uh, talked with uh, some actors from the region, uh, journalists, people who work with it. Uh, but at the same time, um, we, we didn't want to get too contaminated by uh, the things we were told in a way. Uh, and we were trying to look at the context which was of course a, a struggle for us, how much of uh, the context should be in the film, uh, what elements uh, exactly, uh, and how we are positioning ourselves towards this idea of the, uh, of how much, you know, the context would play a role in understanding the characters and what the context serves to more exactly. So the, um, the backstory of the Naxalite movement and the personal experience of Somi was something that we wanted to build through certain elements, very few, that uh, were scattered in the film. And it kind of worked like a puzzle because we also, also felt it like a puzzle as we were discovering uh, from multiple sources uh, all kinds of um, information about the, the Naxalite movement. Um, we, yeah, we tried 
to uh, lay out some elements in order for uh, the audience that is not at all familiar with with it to uh, let's say not be um, intimidated by it in following the story, but also to to trigger a sort of imaginary of this world that Somi once inhabited and Somi was part of and is uh, still very much uh, present in India now and many are leaving it. Um, so for us, the most important research was to actually film, to film people uh, discussing uh, the, our characters, Somi, more especially Somi discussing with others even outside the camera and uh, seeing uh, how they uh, relate to it. But that was for me the, the most uh, important research element, the filming itself. <laughs> um, there are many questions in the- Yeah, no, there's just one more question, but uh, do Isabella and Nadia have anything to add to the research? part of the... I, I, I agree with Christina. It's good to research, but then after a point, you have to uh, start seeing what is happening around you and learn from that. Because sometimes if you research a lot and go with your preconceived notions, which we all do, then you tend to not be as open to what is happening in front of you. At least personally, I feel that. So yeah, what Christina said. The same. Same, I subscribe what the girls said. <laughs> so the first time you went, you did not, you, did, you went without equipment. It was only later on in your second schedule that you started filming? Yes. Yes, with Somi, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, just the last couple of questions. There is uh, one Abhishek. I mean, he asked this very early on, but I was waiting for the, to address this at the end of the conversation. He asked, how was the process of raising funds? for this film? How long did the process take? How stressful was it? Stressful, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Is that you want to go? No. Uh, yes. So, I mean, did people pick up pick up the film very early on or how how uh, how late into your... Uh, the, 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 the process of race funding was like uh, parallel to the process of filming because uh, Going back to the discussion that we are a very, let's say, fluid and independent uh, production company, collective, whatever we are, um, we could, uh, in a way, uh, have the luxury, if you want, to do whatever we want, in the sense of, like, we absolutely started filming without having closed the budget, as they usually say. And it's maybe something we wouldn't have been able to do with another production house because of more understandably so rigid structures. So for us, the process of uh, uh, raising funds was absolutely parallel to the process of making the film. And actually the very last fund that then is the one that allowed us to complete the post-production and actually finish the film, we got it like two months before finishing the film. So it was really like uh, going back and forth between uh, filming, editing, translating, uh, raising funds, writing, pitching. We pitched three times the film. And uh, I mean, it was it was stressful. Many times we had to, I mean, to all the filmmakers that are listening, like, don't get discouraged if you get a no, try again, because it's almost impossible that you get a yes at the first uh, attempt uh, to any funds or whatever. And yeah, it is definitely challenging. It was, I would say that, very stressful it was the I mean not only to actually do it but also to understand which are the funders and the, the forums and the things that are that apply to your film in a way I mean to which your film applies because then of course it changes from film to film and that it goes back to what Christina was saying that this film was a huge uh, uh, educational process for all of us because we really into this into doing this humongous research we really now understood better how this world works and what the each fund is kind of looking for because that's a very crucial thing to know mm. if your film kind of fits uh, the 
not necessarily the requirements, but like the, the vibe, I would say, of a fund or a festival, which is the same. And then, yeah, it eventually came also the festival run, which was another parallel layer that we are taking care of at the moment. So yeah, it is stressful, but it's also fun, I would say. So I, I just want to add one thing because in India we have no state funds or no support for documentary. Really, I at least I before doing my masters had no idea what it is to write for a fund. So uh, it's really important how and what you write, and it's really like in because it also helps you to figure out exactly what film you are making. So it's not just for the fun, but you are also very much doing it for yourself to figure out what it is that you would want to see in your own film and that helps your filming process. So yeah, we have to keep up a line <laughs> till uh, some door opens, <laughs> knock all the, all the doors, I would say. So all three of you are writers also, I mean, along with the other skills and other... Writers is a big word, but we write... Yeah. <laughs> no, even Not if it's about yeah. writing, writing proposals. Yeah, yeah we, I mean, we all contributed, yeah, to, to the writing. I mean, the thing is, uh, I just want to answer specifically to the question that it took uh, three years for the process of fundraising as much as the process of the film took. And we managed to secure the first fund uh, eight months after we met Somi. And with this first fund uh, from Busan, uh, from Asian Cinema Fund, we managed to return. And it was crucial, of course, to get funds because uh, uh, it, we didn't really know how, uh, how we would start the film without any support. And it's not like we had any savings for it to be started although I'm sure we would have put our savings in it. Um, and uh, it was, of course, encouraging that uh, we took it, we managed to secure a, a fund quite early. This is quite early in the process. And this worked as a trigger and encouragement. So then we could return and film and apply to many more for production. And I think in total, we, we probably applied to, um, I don't know, 20, something like that. And to some, we applied also two times. And it was the case uh, for Doha Film Institute that we got it the second time. So we got to know the first time, we tried again, and we uh, secured it the, the second time. So, uh, but yeah, what's uh, discouraging in this uh, process is the fact that you have to wait for a long time, which is usually for the answer from the fund, which is usually an average of three months. So, but as there were many that we were applying uh, and as we were shooting, editing uh, and so, um, yeah, it makes it more bearable, let's see, but yeah. There's a, there's a question for Arya from an aspiring 18-year-old filmmaker who chooses to remain anonymous. Uh, she kind of, the question comes away earlier. She talks, she asks about the economic viability of uh, filmmaking as a career option in India. Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Wait, let's start. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I mean, I, I can speak for myself that uh, I am privileged enough to continue making the documentary yeah. film. I have to say it's a matter of privilege. I don't think in terms of documentary filmmaking, we are there that somebody just really wants to do it and has the opportunity. Because knowing these funds, everything, I could do it because I could study abroad. The cool part of it is that there are some scholarships because I went uh, with a scholarship which makes it tougher to apply to, but if you really want to pursue it, it really depends on your willingness. That European Union has some nice opportunities. Doc Nomads, where we all studied, is a fully funded program. So if you apply to it and if you get the scholarship, then you get to study for two years in Europe, which is really 
amazingly life changing at least for me it was amazingly life changing and uh, i'm still figuring it out as it goes how to make the how to make documentary film making something that can sustain me financially properly so yeah you're just 18 years old so i don't know what all i can uh, say but if you really want to make it you should try at least applying to one of these masters i would say okay that is leaving with a sense of optimism and hope i think we've come to the end of our time uh any more questions do i see any more i think we've answered all the questions and i don't see any more questions here yeah i think this is this, this was wonderful this was fantastic that you allowed our audience into your world and uh, really looking forward to more work from your collective i'll definitely be looking out for some exciting work from you guys yeah thank you once again and uh, isabella christina and arya thank you very much from all of us at vikalp and uh, thank you yes uh, bic thanks once again for this opportunity to bring these fantastic filmmakers young filmmakers on board here yeah it was really thank you nice. very much the film. Yeah, thank you thank you for the questions thank i think so much for the questions it was a very immersive experience <laughs> Yes and we had a fantastic audience with some very fantastic questions also yeah so thank you once again and all the very best yeah okay bye bye bye